Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. And I'm Kirsten Oates. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Welcome everyone to this special session. This is the end of our series Turning to the Mystics on St. John of the Cross. And so in the session today, Jim will be addressing some of the questions that came in. Uh, but before we begin, Jim, you just wanted to make a bit of an opening statement about the questions and where we're headed. Yes, yes. Um, you know, first of all, there, there were a lot of questions. Yeah. And I read them all, went through all of them. And uh, several thoughts is that when they're really great questions, because there's the, they're the kind of questions that contemplative seekers ask, because mm -hmm. it's endlessly evocative. You know, what about this and what about that? And that's normal. That's a good sign like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and because there were so many, uh, we could actually, which we won't, um, actually go through each of the questions, taking like five to ten minutes on each one, mm -hmm. giving the time they deserve. And it might take us a year to do that, <laughs> because about two years. And uh, that would be a good podcast, by the way, yeah. because it'd be all real. But we sh I don't think we should change format like this. I think we should stay going, because the accumulative effect of just listening to these mystics, it soaks into you. Little by little, it gets clearer and clearer as time goes by, like that. And also, uh, thought too about these questions, it just shows you that we're, we're right at the edge of spiritual direction. We take one step further, see what matters is how this is unfolding in you. How is this unfolding in me? And we just stay with that and move with that. So I was very encouraged by the number of questions and the quality and sincerity of the questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this dialogical part of our time together, I think is key to what we're doing. Yes, you know. yeah, I agree, Jim, and I read all the questions also. And uh, just really thank everyone for making the effort to, to communicate with us that way. Uh, also, Jim, I have heard you say too that uh, reading the questions the way you do, I mean, you've taken many days with them, um, will influence what you teach in, with the next mystic and certain things you might emphasize and notice. So the questions will help with that part of the podcast as well. Exactly. You know, when I give these silent contemplative retreats, which I don't do anymore, and um, uh, after each conference and e the sittings, there's questions. Mm -hmm. And so by the end, when it, when it ends, that last session, not only are they more in the flow of it together, but I'm more in the flow of where they are, you know, in the way mm. I respond to them. And I think that's ex exactly right about these questions, yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. moving along together here. Yeah. So not one wasted, just all really appreciated and... Yes. Exactly. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, let's start with one of the questions. I'm, I'm going to read this question from Josh, who says, There is somewhere in the eternal distance something that tells me that silence is precisely what I'm supposed to be finding. And there is, I suppose, some comfort in that. But in the meantime, I have to make decisions about everyday life and how best to live out a calling to share my own experience and teach and balance that with making a living and having a family. Should I sell my house and pack up with my wife and kids and go back to school to put more of my time and efforts into studying and writing? Should I write more music, make more recordings and play more shows and connect with people that way? Should I put more focus on the kind of teaching that I'm currently doing and try to make more of that? Should I simplify my life so that I can put more quality time into being with my family? There are not enough hours in the day and every endeavor that I consider seems possible and worthwhile, but I can't do them all and I long for guidance and I don't know how to be led by silence, even though I think that may be the answer. I'm just not certain how to let it be the yes, answer. Very good. Um, but let's say first that um, when we're interiorly called to a more contemplative way of life, um, that path, that following that contemplative path, 
is incarnate in our vocational calling. So, for example, in the monastery, um, the monastic life is carefully designed to remove all the distracting complexities. Where there's just nothing but the silence and the psalms and the like, like that. and that's their vocation, you know. And, and and in that silence, it has its own challenges. It's not like a it's like that. But what we're doing is how do we hear when we feel this contemplative call, and we live in the midst of the world. And so, what what does it mean to be a contemplative layperson in the midst of the world? How do we? That's what we're about here, I think. And so my thought is this, one way to look at it, would be, let's say, like, is married. And so we might say your primary vocation is your marriage. And um, that you're being called to love and be loved by your wife, and she by you. And uh, to walk that walk together with its challenges and setbacks and growth and sense of the holiness of that and so on, it matters. And also then with your children, see how parenting has its own abundance of problems and graces and, you know, it's, it's these, the real world sifts us like wheat. I mean, we kind of, we walk our walk and how can I learn to be a, a clear-minded, authentic, vulnerable, loving, patient, ever more honest person in the world? See? The next level, then if, we, if we're endowed with the gift of faith, how can we let our faith illumine this path through, through our, the prayer and uh, our union with God so that our union with God can illumine our union with the people that we live with? Like how, how is God, what's God asking of me here is a question of discernment. And how do you sort it out? You pray over it and you talk it over with your spouse. You journal it out, you think all things considered, what seems to be the best thing right now and I find my way, there's that. What we're talking about here, too, in the light of that, assuming all the above, and we are, is this thing you mentioned at the be- about silence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the person just gets the feeling that it's called to listen to silence, be present to silence, but just how to do that. And see, that's the contemplative part. So I have, I have a few thoughts then. And this assumes and permeates everything I've already said. This assume this permeates everything. Is it's that's that silence is not is, it starts first of all by fidelity to a daily rendezvous with God in which you sit in silence. So in the silence you're listening to God. The lecture that you can hear God speaking to you. Also in the silence, you're very sensitive to moments that you were silenced by the beloved's embrace, your child's laughter, mm. the darkness of the night. There are, certain, there are certain moments where the silence is not just refraining from speech or from thought, but you are silenced by the unexpected beauty or the unexpected closeness. You listen very closely to those moments. Next, in your daily rendezvous with God, in your prayer and reflection and silence, what you're doing really is cultivating the habit of that interior silence of being silenced, mm. like this. And as you listen to the silence, the silence deepens, little by little by little. And so th- the readings of these mystics, they're guiding us in that. Because if you've noticed, all these talks on the mystics, we can't follow them unless we listen. But we have to listen in a very intimate way. We can't listen by trying to figure out what they're saying. It's not figure out <laughs> It isn't. But what we can do is sense in the cadence and rhythms of their voice that which silences our heart see, and puts us to rest to listen ever more deeply. See. And then we ask God then to bring that silent attentiveness to hear God's voice and not to break the thread as we carry it out to be in our marriage or with our children or with our work, our creative endeavors. And so it's a lifetime learning curve mm-hmm. uh, of habituating this, but I think the uniquely contemplative part is the silence, mm-hmm. you know, yes. um, which is this deep inner silence of being silent, mm-hmm. being silenced. And, uh, and then in the silence we listen 
And then there's intimations of God's voice that come to us in the silence. And the mystic's voice echoes with those cadences. That's why they're so that's why they mean so much to us. Mm. They help us to get attuned to that. So, Jim, I I heard two two things uh, for Josh to notice. One was um, just uh, committing to a daily practice of silence, if he feels drawn to silence, to to committing to a daily practice of silence, of meditation. And then the second thing is to notice throughout the day where he might experience what you called like his heart being silenced and, 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 and those moments of silence. And um, I am curious about, um, that's obviously a metaphor, but what, 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 is, what does that mean, my heart is silenced? Uh, it means, um, I'll give an example, mm-hmm. and then how we can do it as a choice. Let's say, he's, he's, a, he's a five, he has children. Mm-hmm. Take it. And let's say he's, I don't know how old the children are, but let's say he's reading one of the children a good night story. And in reading the goodnight story, the children says, Daddy, it says something, and his heart melts. Mm. It's just his heart melts. And uh, we're having a talk with his wife over dinner, and they linger over dinner. And the conversation goes to a very deep place they didn't expect it to go. Mm. See? And so there are certain moments where you pick up the subtlety, you know, where like the refining of attentiveness that happens mm-hmm. like that. Then the next thing is we can then choose to take the backward step and a middle pause before we respond. Mm. So, for example, I'll say how it happens often in therapy. Um, I would say working with trauma, someone's going through something, they're going through a lot, some big crisis kind of thing. And, and I, I realize as I listen, this person's in a very deep place, it's complicated. Mm-hmm. And if I go barging in with a lot of ready-made answers, I'll get in the way. You know, if I say I got a lot of thoughts for you, take notes. I got the answer. <laughs> I miss the point. Mm. I miss the point. Yeah. So if instead, before I say anything, I pause, and in the pause, I step back to listen at a more interior level, that somehow comes closer to the interior level of the pain that they're sharing. Then once I'm attuned to the pain that they're sharing, then when I speak and say something, I say something that's empathic with that. And because I meet them at that level, that helps them to listen to themselves. So it isn't as if there aren't practical decisions to be made, but the decisions themselves are grounded in that depth dimension. And then when you feel you're getting off track, like you're talking too much, you're going off with all your answers, whatever, you pause again. So you're endlessly circling back to slow down over and over to be more and more present. And eventually that becomes a habit Mm. of learning to be with yourself, you know, learning to be with the other person. And that's the contemplative way to be in the world, I think. Mm. And then what you're really doing is that's an echo of how you learn to be with God. Yeah. And so with God, it's the same way. And then you can sense God's presence speaking to you through this person, through this event. And that's that's my sense. Of oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And it's an echo of how God is with us. Is that? Yeah. It's unexplainable. Yeah. This is unexplainably. And, um, and then anyone who's committed to a creative process, whatever, they realize what they're doing is they're kind of, it's the outflow of what was given to them. And that attentiveness, which makes the creativity deep, mm. you know, it gives it substance because it doesn't come out of the ego. It comes through the person, um, and wh- whatever it is that they're engaged in. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love the way you connected um, practice and life in that in that answer. That that's so helpful, Jim. I have another question. Um, <laughs> this one is from Ed, and Ed says. I'm a first mansion person who does not pray well or pray often. As a result, I'm just starting along a path of trying to see God in all things. This is very hard as I find that I'm distracted and in my head constantly. My habits of the mind and heart get in the way. As I learn about John of the Cross's teachings, I'm feeling that his teaching is too advanced for me as I'm at such an early stage of my spiritual life. Please help me understand how to approach his teachings as a true spiritual beginner. Yes. 
I want to give an example. By the way, it's not alone. <laughs> this is if he's the only one in all these people who feels this way. <laughs> <clears throat> Thomas Burton once said, let's face it, we're beginners all of our life. Yeah. Really yeah. So. I want to give an example. Let's say you don't know any French. And you decide for personal enrichment, you're going to sign up and take a class. It's a beginner's class to learn French. You'd like to learn French or read French, whatever. And inadvertently, without realizing it, when you get in the class, you realize that all the students are fifth-year doctoral-level French <laughs> students, and they all the classes they're all talking in French. You can kind of tell you're out of your league. You know, like <laughs> you better quietly slip out the door and go get reassigned. I'm in the wrong class, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how you can feel in things like this. Yeah. That these mystics are for God, they're mystics for God's sake. So <laughs> really. And so for that reason, I mean, one option you may feel it's just this isn't for you right now. You know, that's possible, maybe later. Um, but I would suggest something else, too, by the very fact that you were drawn to do that. And then uh, all, all those along with you feel this way, too. There's something in you drew you to start to listen to this. So I have some thoughts. One is... Um, Listen to the mystics that start out by talking to beginners. So Teresa of Avila, the first three mansions, if you get the interior castle, talking to beginners. The next mystic we're going to look at together is uh, Guigo the Sa Guigo's work, A Ladder of Monks. And he starts out with Alexio Divina, discursive meditation and prayer as a ladder to heaven. And he, he gives very practical guidelines on very basic Lexio, very basic. Because if we don't do our homework on the basic levels and try to go right to the mystical, we keep falling off the ladder. Mm. <laughs> we have yeah. to do our homework. And that's holiness, really. We, we just want to do God's will. So we're always circling back around so we can join God where God's joining us where we are right now. And it'll, it'll grow by itself. Mm -hmm. That's the next thought. Another another thought I have here is that when you're another by the way Thomas Merton is very good this way too because he's to beginners a lot of his language is so direct you know and by the way the pastoral writings of Richard Rohr and the other teachings of the Living Score very pastoral mm -hmm. this way it's coming out of a very contemplative pastoral connection to things so you find the people that resonate meet you or you are and you you go from there yeah. The next thought is, let's say you're reading Thomas Merton or you're reading Teresa or you're listening to one of the podcasts, whatever. And, and let's say that a single phrase strikes you. It just strikes you. So if you're listening to the podcast for a minute, you'd put it on pause. <laughs> you don't just rush right over it. <laughs> like the gate of heaven flies open, you go walking right past it. <laughs> you put, and you sit with what is it in that saying of Teresa or whatever it is, what is it that got to you? And really, was it an echo of God's voice in your heart on the intimacy of the beautiful? And in that moment, you pause. You're, in the moment, you were quickened. You were a momentary mystic. And the moment you freely choose to pause and rest in what fleetingly awakened you, you're living the contemplative life. So the thing about this, I know it sounds very up in the air and so on, but when you really look at what they're saying, it's the opposite. It's disarmingly simple. That's why it's so hard to figure out. We, you know, we're trying to figure it out or get it, but there's nothing to get. Mm. See, we're trying to be disarmed by searching for explanations to be vulnerable to the intimacy of what can never be explained, but which we tasted in our heart. And then we learn to listen to it. And if you learn to be very patient that way and start connecting the dots, mm -hmm. so you start to find an inner constancy, like an habituated sensitivity to that level. And that, I think that's, to me, I found that very um, um, helpful, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of, always circling back to be where we're because that's where god's waiting for us yeah god's not saying god, god's not patiently waiting for us to become mystical <laughs> god's patiently waiting for us to taste the mystical depth of simple things mm. and to be true to ourselves and very patient and grateful and then it grows by itself mm. 
and constancy to that. And um, so anyway, that, that, that's the approach I would suggest. That's so helpful, Jim, and beautiful. Um, I got the sense too, though, even reading uh, Ed's question, the way he used quotes from the mystics in his question, that he's well on his way to yeah, being yeah. touched uh, by the mystics. <laughs> that, that, that's why we could tell it. Look, look what you're doing. You're quoting mystics already. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> I mean, holy cow. <laughs> Something's happening. Just keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought that, I certainly thought that. Or he could be a, mis uh, a mystic comedian in the making. He <laughs> could, he could. My, yeah. I, don't well, well, I don't pray well and I don't pray often. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or we could also say if he would go to one of these mystics for spiritual direction, mm -hmm. and he have an hour with St. Teresa of Avila or whoever, mm -hmm. and he would just tell them, I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. I can't get it. And the mystic would say back, exactly. <laughs> of course you don't. <laughs> because if you understood it, it wouldn't be what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. It'd be just one more thing that you understand. See, you're trying to be gently humbled. Yeah. Merton says one of the great things about monastic life is freedom from the need to understand, which is to comprehend, which is really a deeper way to understand what it means to understand, mm. which is to be awakened or grateful or amazed, like that. Yeah. Another question. This one is from David. Presumably, John of the Cross wrapped his prayer in the daily community prayer of the church and the Eucharist as a Carmelite priest. But what of now? Is the same wraparound or context there? And if so, is there a need to make its connection stronger? Or what place does the Eucharist play in the life of the contemplative? Um, yes, let's, let's say first that these, notice that all these mystics that we're studying are all celibates. They're all priests, they're monastics, they're cloistered nuns, they're hermits. What the? And so for John of the Cross, he was a priest. And so to celebrate the Eucharist, to hear confessions, to give homilies, to be to spiritual direction. Same with Thomas Merton. He was a vowed religious who was a priest. He was a, same with Eckhart, the Dominican priest, theologian, teacher. And so for them, uh, their vocation is grounded in the language of that. Mm -hmm. But the mystic, these mystic priests and nuns and so on, they bear witness they don't get caught up in the theological formulations and rituals, but see the formulations as poetry, mm. or see the formulations as parables, or see the revelation of um, the, the mystery of Christ's incarnate infinity, which is life itself. So within the tradition, the heart of the tradition, they go beyond the teachings of the tradition. So belief, like the creed, the creed is a sign of faith. Mm. But we're not saved by belief. We're saved by faith. And faith is an obscure habit in the heart, as in a mirror darkly. We know that God's unexplainably with us in all things which is how Christ lived his life. So there's that. Now for us as laymen, say we're in the, I'm in the Catholic tradition, person Catholic, whatever tradition you're in, I think it's personal. Certainly, I know, I know for me, when I was raised by my mother, who was a devout Catholic, I was very Catholic that way. In the monastery, I was very Catholic. And, um, uh, uh, and in some ways, I still am very, very Catholic. I have the Eucharist here in my home. And I have icons all over the place. And when Maureen was living, she was very Catholic. Mm. But it, but in another way, for me, I haven't I haven't been to mass in over five years, and I haven't been to Sunday mass. I think in over ten years. Don't care to go. Too crowded for me. I don't care for it. But when I would be giving silent contemplative retreats, I always saw to it that there was a contemplative liturgy on the retreat. I also had it where we, they would, were invited to stay up and get up during the middle of the night on Saturday night and have an exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. I had a deep sense of this mystical dimension of Eucharist. When I was seeing people in therapy over at St. Monica's Church, 
often between clients, I would walk over and sit alone in the church. So I'm very Catholic, like in the ethos, the beauty of it. But it doesn't pertain to me anymore, like participating in that way. I don't feel the need for that. Or, so to your own self be true. Mm. You know, you have to, it's a, a discernment question. To what extent and in what ways in which is your active involvement in the local parish and the sacraments and whatever? And what's the contemplative death dimension of that involvement? Like that. So it's a, I, I, that's my sense of it. Mm -hmm. By the way, when I was at the monastery, one of the novices um, uh, raised his hand and asked Thomas Merton, and Merton was giving this talk on the presence of God. And he says, you know, you get the impression that the church teaches that God's everywhere. But God's, but God's so God's present everywhere, but God's really present in the church. <laughs> so in order to get closer, you have to go in the church to be where God's really present. And then God's really, really present in the Eucharist. <laughs> and then God's really, really, really present, you know, in heaven. Mm -hmm. So when you get out to the ordinary life, it's like one part per billion or something. If you're lucky, <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> You can pick up a little divinity here and there, but it's a kind of a very diluted affair. Mm -hmm. But God's really, 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 really the reality of everywhere. Yeah. But sometimes you need a holy place to help you recognize the holiness of every place. Yeah. You need a holy time to recognize the holiness of all time. You need a holy meal to realize the holiness of meals. And I think that's the transformative power of you know, the, of, of that for me. So anyway, that's, that's the approach that helps me. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's, you, you teach, Jim, about how it's so easy to skim over the depth of our own life and the busyness of the day-to-day. -day. So what, what are reminders for people? Where, and if it's not church and the Eucharist, uh, is there something, something else that they can have as a sacred space yeah. in their home? Or a, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. Remember years ago, Chi and Chong. Do you remember Chi? Like old burnout hippie here, and they had one of their songs that they used to sing is uh, <laughs> Catholic. Uh, two, four, six, eight. Time to transubstantiate. Everybody on your knees, fiddle with your rosaries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. And by the way, some people are going over the surface of their life because they're sitting there at mass as a, as an as an empty gesture. And answers, and they walk out and go home, and then argue with each other. Mm. You know, so it depends on what you make of it. Yeah, you know, it depends on where you're. That's Richard Rohr, the new orthodoxy is Jesus, the orthodoxy of love, and then the sacraments radiate that, insofar as they call us to surrender to that radiation. Yes, and not, you know, give in to it as a set of answers or. This. So it's a very, it's a personal thing. That's you know. good. You can be. You can be. Busy skimming over the depth of your own life in church is what you said. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Merton once said there's a lot of Catholics losing their faith and they're losing it in church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the church isn't bearing witness to its own mystical heritage. Mm -hmm. See? And so you can really be fleeing from God through heavy church. And the reason some people are at church every night, they can't bear to go home. Mm -hmm. you know? Whereas church is meant to help us go home with a Christ like heart. Yeah. You know, and to bring it home every day, and so on. Yeah, yeah so. I, I, I really appreciate the way you teach um, about the measure, the measure of our faith being love, and yeah. uh, so w would when people met Saint John of the Cross, would they say he did he was great with the Eucharist, or, or would they say he was a very loving man, and and that's what what made him a mystic? He, yeah. he was both. You yeah. know what I mean? He was. A, he, by the way, there's another thing about the, the podcast, too, is I was giving a conference in Cleveland, this big Episcopal church, and this longtime friend of mine who's a priest, he raised his hand, and he said, do you think you're about mystical union with God and so on with these retreatants? He said, do you think you're preaching to the choir? That is everybody here, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, I hope so. Because Catholics will come to me after these retreats, and they'll say, how come I don't hear this in church? Mm. Now, how come I don't hear anybody talk about this simple, wordless communion? You know? So who talks to those? And I think that's what the podcast is about. I think it's a hunger for this depth and simplicity of presence, which is really at the heart of our faith, really. But it, it's, you know, we need to keep bearing witness to it and, and gather where, it's, where we can meet it somewhere. Yes. 
Turning to the mystics will continue in a moment. So Jim, here's a question from Sharon, and she said, I was listening to the first session of St. John of the Cross where you gave a list of how you can tell you are becoming a mystic, a list of, a list of attributes. And she's saying, what if many of those attributes are true but you really, really, really don't want to be a mystic? And there's some um, uppercase letters there. Uh, can God make you one without your agreement? Or maybe it's an inner agreement. And then she says, asking for a friend. <laughs> LOL. LOL. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, Sharon, you can tell your friend. Okay. <laughs> wink, wink. No. no, let's let's talk about this. That's a real question. Yeah. That's a real question. I think this. Um, I think being uh, sensitively responsive to mystical things as a gift. You know, you, you, you pick up in the innuendos and the intimations, you know, something that you interiorly recognize, you're kind of drawn to it. So it's a, it's a, predis, it's a grace predisposition like that. Um, and then you realize, then the next step would be that you realize within yourself a longing to abide in it. as a calling, you know, calling. And that's what these mystics are. They're writing for people who are being so called. Mm -hmm. See? <clears throat> and then you realize that to follow this path is going to ask of me, mm. you know, the letting go or the giving up of the present state that I'm in, which although I'm accustomed to it, I find lacking in the depth that I recognize. But I'm not yet ready to let go of those compromising things like this. And that's a, that's a very great place to be at. This is a second mansion for Teresa. And um, so, so then the question becomes, See, who, what will become of me if I surrender to this calling? But what will become of me if I don't? Mm. See, that the price paid for the half-lived life is bitter. See, and if something calls on us, but since love is off, always offered and never imposed, it's a calling. And God understands infinitely more than you do while you're not ready yet. Mm. So the thing is to be sincere with God and tell God you're not. I'm just not there yet. And of course, God is saying to you, I, I understand that infinitely more than you do. But notice I already touched you even before you knew it existed. Mm. See? So why don't when you pray, when, when you're with me in prayer, why don't you and I talk over why it's kind of scary to come closer to me See? in this wordless way like this? And, and what is it about it? that you find scary. Because at one level, it is scary to the self that's still identified with what compromises the heart. It is scary. It's like the alcoholic who's afraid to go to AA meetings because if he does, he might have to give up drinking, even though the drinking is killing him. Mm. But it's only till he goes, see, uh, having admitted, we have come to admit, that we have, we're powerless over it. So why not be in this very gentle place? I'm not going to make any moves on you. See, I have your best interests at heart. I'm infinitely trustworthy. <laughs> why don't we just stay? And I think what you might find in that unhurried willingness to be like that, see, you'll find that the, the, these mystical depths will come welling up out of the sensitivities of that willingness. And then you might find the whole path is like that. Mm. Really, I think. And um, um, so, um, uh, I, I, I would suggest that tone mm -hmm, to it, mm -hmm. and just uh, stay. And by the way, sometimes a person feels that, understandably, who knows what else they're dealing with in their yeah. life. Life's hard sometimes, you're just not up to it. Yeah. Um, um, 
uh, but sometimes what they discover is the infinite patience of God. And a week later or five years later, it's there again. Mm. But you're at a different place. Mm. And what you couldn't respond to before is now given to you to respond to it. So almost like it's trusting that in an a open, in a open-ended, freewheeling way, everything's right on schedule. Mm. And your very ambivalence is a grace. And, but the thing is to listen to the ambivalence and respect it. So there's a part of you that longs for it, but there's a part of you is afraid of what you long for. And you need to be respectful to the part that's afraid and talk to it and understand what it's afraid of and be there for it. Because mm. God's there for it. So I think it's a spiritual direction question. I think these kinds of sensitivities yeah. are helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, just, uh, Jim, I realize we talk about spiritual direction quite a lot, and uh, not everyone even knows what a spiritual director is. Um, so it m might be worth just uh, def kind of talking a little bit about when you say spiritual direction, that it could be with your pastor in a church, right, like pastoral spiritual direction, but there are people who have a vocation and are certified as spiritual directors. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the questions has to do with how do you find, how do you know you're with a dark knight director? Yes, yes. And we could go to that now yeah, if you want. Yeah, I, I can read the question. Why don't we read it? Because it kind of segues into that, I think. Yeah, that's a great idea. So this that question's from Lynn, and she yeah. said, how could I identify a dark knight experience teacher for guidance today? What would you say are their characteristics? Yeah. Here's what I used to say to, sometimes I'll say to people in my all my talks with people who talk to me about these things. <clears throat> um, is there are people who realize how great it would be to find a contemplative director, um, and they're still looking. There are people looking for a contemplative director. They have a director, a, like a pastoral counselor. Like, how is God present in this situation? How is God? But when it comes to this, they don't know what you're talking about. Mm. I also talk to people who are looking for a contemplative director, found their contemplative director, and he ran off with the cook. <laughs> you know, he kind of went to Idaho or some damn place. <laughs> like, it was so great while it lasted. Thomas Burton once told me, he said, once in a while, you'll find somebody with whom you can talk about such things, but it's a temporary arrangement. Mm. And you'll spend most of your life without such a person like this. So how do you know you've found a, a contemplative director? How, where do you even look for such a... You don't look them up in the yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way of a pilgrim, it's funny. He has this question, and... Uh, he says he went from village to village knocking on doors, asking to have any contemplative directors in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's really funny. It's not, it's not the longest search. Um, uh, so once one approach, I know people are all over the place listening to this, mm -hmm. but one place to look is if you're near a retreat house. And at the retreat house, you look on their schedule, they offer contemplative retreats. And you call and ask, do you have any spiritual directors there who do contemplative spiritual direction? Mm. They're they're they're, hard, they're not always easy to find. Yeah, you know, and um, and so how do you know you found such a person? Here's I think here's how you tell that when you're sitting with the person and you struggle to find words to express such things, they understand you. That's how you know. See? That's how you know you, they listen, and um, you can tell there's a resonance in them that they're comfortable with what you're saying. Mm. And um, they offer guidance in that. And uh, might have to work out in other ways, personality-wise and different things. Mm -hmm. But I think that's how you tell. Mm -hmm. I think it's another spiritual direction is two people sitting together, uh, sharing such things that neither one can explain. Mm. But they recognize in the, in, the, in the exchange back and forth and notice, by the way, then, the writings of the mystics are contemplative spiritual direction. See? Because when you realize your own heart knows what they're talking about, even though a lot of it is still hidden. See? In the timeless world of grace, 
the deathless presence of the spiritual master, John of the Cross, Teresa, they're like right there. And uh, you're the directee. And the, their deathless presence lives in the depth of their words. Mm. You know, and you follow it, and you cherish it, and you walk with it. And um, so on. But I think really, um, I think really that's how you find it. The person understands mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Do you think, Jim, just going back to, to where we started today around the silence, do you think spiritual direction, the contemplative spiritual direction is really like trying to have a conversation out of that silence? It's like trying yes. to kind of um, attune to that depth dimension in a conversation um, ab about life, about what's happening I, in I your life. I do very, very much so. Very, that's why I think this has also has to do with deep healing work and therapy too. But in the of the spiritual direction, the two people are talking. And in, in the exchange, there's a moment like silence between mm -hmm. them. And there's also the shared recognition that if they would say something, they would prematurely intrude upon that silence. Mm. So it would be words that would break the silence. But they can also tell that when they wait, the words come to them in silence. They don't break the silence, but manifest it. Mm. See? You know? It's the same way with the mystics. It's coming out of a deep silence, like an eternal silence. Yes. But when you read them out loud very slowly, they're not words that intrude upon the silence. You know, the logos, they're words that manifest and, you know, which is God's word, it's, it's silence of God uh, speaking all things into being. And we move in the rhythms of that creative voice and we, we move back and forth with each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's also true, in, I think it's also true in any intimate conversation with people who are very intimate with each other. There are certain moments between them where everything they say comes out of a shared listening, you know, and they're sharing the listening back. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. I, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. And just going back to what you said at the very beginning, I'm just thinking about uh, when you read these questions, you, you, you could feel that they can't come out of that deeper place. Yeah. And I'm sure you paused and, and sat yes. with it before before you thought about how to answer yeah very much so mm. and, and how i i was comparing to what it feels like on retreats when, I, when there's questions at the end people raise their mm -hmm. hand and uh it's so moving because of the depth of sincerity the question expresses okay? and so i realized if, if i read the first question there are 30 pages of single space questions <laughs> That if I would just, skip, like, got that one next, next, right. next, I'd be betraying what this is about. Yeah. See? And so how do I slow it way down to be present to a question so that I can join the person in the depth from which their question arises and respond in such a way that they, that person, and along with everyone listening with us, because this is contemplative church, this work, it's a community. Mm -hmm. Um, we're all together, but we're together not because something's being explained, but we're together because we can tell the the words are flowing from a space in which we've gathered together to be transformed in those, you know, which is God's word in us, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Well, I think this is a great time. We had one voicemail come in. And uh, so Corey's going to play it for us. Hi, Jim. Uh, my name is John. I'm just west of Philly. And I would love to hear you riff on just this. Uh, you've made mention a number of times that Thomas Merton says that there's a sort of loneliness to being a mystic. And I've enjoyed these figures, uh, Merton and Teresa and now St. John of the Cross for so long but I found so few people that know how to talk about them. And sometimes it feels as though there's that sense of loneliness because I've gone through my own Dark Night of the Soul and I, I read Dark Night of the Soul as it was happening, but it's so rare to find someone else who's gone through a Dark Night of the Soul for themselves and mm -hmm. let alone even knows how to talk about it. So if it's possible, I'd love to just hear you um, riff although you do more than just riff <laughs> you drop pearls for us if you can maybe speak to 
the loneliness that can happen from being on the other side of the dark night of the soul, from having passed through it and how that absolutely changes yeah. everything. And so what do we do with this yes. mystic loneliness? Again, my name is John. Thank you so much for your time. I very much look forward to hearing your response. Cheers. Yeah. By the way, uh, in Thomas Merton's book, Disputed Questions, it's a series of contemplative essays. He has an essay on a philosophy of solitude. And Maureen used to read that over and over and over. It's a lovely piece mm. on mystical loneliness and the intimacy of loneliness and so on. So let's reflect on loneliness for a minute. Yeah. Like this, the phenomena of loneliness. Let's say one level of loneliness is being all alone. No one's around who we don't want to be. So that's a human experience. We're lonely. There's a deeper kind of loneliness in which we're lonely with people who we can tell can't see who we are. Mm. See? And you can't make yourself seen. That's, that's a deeper loneliness, I think. I think there's a deeper kind of loneliness in which you're lonely for yourself. See? That somehow you sense within yourself a depth of presence and you're kind of caught in the centrifuge of uh, things that spin you out toward the edge of things. And you're trying to abide at the center. You know, you're kind of, how do I, why do I live like, why do I live in such exile? For, like I'm lonely for myself. Mm. So, which is the opposite of the ego's preoccupation with itself, which is what the deep self keeps the deep self so lonely. Mm. You know, because uh, I thought, there's that. Then <clears throat> there's the loneliness for God. And the loneliness for God is an echo of God's infinite loneliness for you. Mm. Yeah. See? And, um, and so the gift of loneliness then, mystical loneliness, see? we're talking about re re modalities of that. And one thing I think is this, another way I think helps me to look at it, is any time anybody radically surrenders to a calling, for example, not just someone who occasionally reads poetry or appreciates poetry or every so often writes poetry, but they're called to surrender their whole life over to the beauty of the poetic, like Roca, Letters to a Young Poet. For such a person on such a path, they're lonely because the people around them no longer understand what it is that's happened to this person. Mm. And you don't blame them for it because you don't understand it either. And so that loneliness is... But the thing is, Merton says, is the thing about loneliness at this level, it's a loneliness that enters into the loneliness of all of humanity. That the more... He said, you'll never find the intimacy you're looking for by walking around that loneliness, but only by going right through the center oh, of it. Wow. And when you do, you discover where our lives converge. Because one way of understanding loneliness or solitude is you're less and less able to explain to anybody, including yourself, what's happening to you. Mm. See, I'm lonely. Like I, and yet I'm on a pilgrimage because it, that's what keeps calling me to itself deeper, 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 deeper. And the same way as someone who becomes an artist, not just occasionally, but they give themselves over to the beautiful that flows through them, the, the ascesis or discipline that, so that can happen. Or anyone committed to deep healing, or anyone connected to the suffering of others, anyone connected to solid. So anyone who really uh, sets out to be faithful mm. to the depth, the simple intimacy of this calling, see, they're alone and that they're less and less able to explain but if they really look at it, at one level, although they're left alone, there's a loneliness to this. Sometimes I used to realize when I'd go on tour giving retreats <laughs> and talk like this, part of it when I was with a room full of people who are like this too, I wasn't so lonely anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. But we're all, you've got a room full of lonely people yeah. who yeah. realize how one they are with God. It's very strange. But I think another way to look at this kind of loneliness is that the more we are transformed in this way, 
the discernment that it's authentic is that it radicalizes our communion with others. So it's like a, a, a Catholic writer, Romano Gardini, he said, he has this, when a saint puts it, he says, oh, it's a realization that although I am not God, I'm not other than God either. Although I'm not any of you, I'm not other than any of you either. And although I'm not the earth, I'm not other than the earth either. He says, I believe this is the essence of this realization. So it's the loneliness that is paradoxically the all-encompassing communion of you and God, the living and the dead, of birth and death, and thing, and uh, I think it's that. Mm. You know, it's the loneliness of Jesus. You know, his own disciples didn't understand him. Mm. He spent whole nights alone in prayer. He was executed. You know, and um, he who sees the Father sees me. So I think it's a deep question, really, that we not addictively numb or flee from the loneliness at one level. We be patient with ourselves and don't overdo it. Mm -hmm. We need to pace this because the loneliness is the is the counterpoint of the intimacy. See, they interpenetrate each other, and uh, so I th perspective like these help me. And then I think the gift of the podcast is it's a language where we're not alone in being somebody like mm -hmm. this, you know. And also, when I used to travel, I used to go back and forth across the United States and Canada and. So half a dozen times or so in Europe, it was so interesting. Is so that wherever I went, and at the end we'd all, we we do these things. I would ring the bell. Wherever we went, we'd sit still, sit straight, and bow, and we'd ring the bell. And whenever I would sit in silence in a room of people like that, it's the same all over the world. Mm. That's why if you're in your own living room, you sit. You can never sit alone, because you're sitting with people all over the world who are sitting. Mm. And we're all woven into each other. So to me, that's some perspectives on solitude that helped me. Yeah, that's really helpful, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. I have two technical questions. And um, I might start with the, the, there's one about the dark night. Um, Jim, tell me if it's okay to answer this one today. But there, there was a question that came in. What is the difference between the two dark nights? night of senses and night of the spirit can you describe the night of the spirit no no we can do that but i want to be sure we want to get to that the, one uh, about uh, yeah. uh, mysticism with yes uh, evelyn under that'll be the last yeah. one uh, well so let's so let's go back again to john of the cross what's the difference between the night of the senses and the night of the spirit again for john of the cross and each mystic has his own words for this the dark night is the grace process in which God weans us off our ability to experience God in finite ways. So we're accustomed to experiencing God in our prayer, in our reflection, in our lexio, in our, and we go for our rendezvous with God, and God doesn't show up for the thing because God's weaning us off our dependency on finite ways of experiencing the infinite presence of God, which is to clear the way for the infinite way of experiencing the infinite presence of God that obscurely foreshadows when we pass through the veil of death into eternal glory. See? And so the night of the senses starts with gratification. You see, gratification through the five senses, the, the, the appetites are the five senses fueled with the desire for gratification through our eyes, through touch, through sound, through, to be gratified. And what you realize is that the that which gratifies the senses, that which gratifies the senses, are finite. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the mountains, the the evening, whatever it is, it's, it's a finite. And the senses that perceive the finite beauty is finite. And the you that's gratified. By the finite beauty <laughs> of the finite thing is finite. The whole thing is, it's all graced. Mm -hmm. You know, God creates it. God's completely present in it, and God creates it. There's a holiness to it. But it's finite. And so what happens in the dark night of the senses is that deprivation of gratification. If we don't panic and we don't run away, 
there begins to well up out of that powerlessness, that lack of gratification, a very subtle, sweet gratification. It's so mysterious because it's infinite. It's infinite. And it, it isn't like either or, like all of a sudden it switches over. You go back and forth, back and forth. So little by little, you get more and more acclimated to the infinite gratification that's beyond the darkness of this world that doesn't separate us from the world, but circles back around for the divinity of the concreteness of sensory gratification. To take a sip of water, to smell a flower, to talk to somebody. You realize the intimate that you realize the divinity, the intimate immediacy of sensory experience like that. Mm -hmm. So that's my sense of that. Mm -hmm. see? The, the, the same process continues with the, with the spirit, which he starts with, we focus on faith. And so what happens, refers to, to the mind, is our thoughts about God, our reflections on God, our insights on God. And let's say they're revealed. Let's say they're all true. Let's say it's all theologically sound. Then let's say it is true. It's important. But it's finite. Mm. See? It's finite. And so, so what happens, it, uh, what God does is that God very gently weans us off being satisfied with explanations for anything. See? And he talks about the nakedness of faith. And the image, again, with the faith, is if a man born blind were told about the color yellow, he would know through faith the color yellow exists, but since he was born blind, he had no essential knowledge of what the yellow is. He says, so it is with faith. We say God is eternal, God is love, God is trinity. All that's true, but we don't know what that means. Yeah. Mm. We have ideas of what it means that are an echo of faith. But we're, we're not... We're not going to spend all of eternity thinking about the Trinity. You know, we're, we're going to be passing beyond the frontiers of thought, the frontiers. And so that's what the dark night of faith is. Now, both the night of the senses and the night of faith have a passive aspect and an active aspect. The passive aspect, it happens to you. See, all of a sudden, you're rendered helpless to be gratified, helpless to grasp. The active night is you freely cooperate with that. Because the ego resists it. See? He, he, he keeps trying to circle back to habit again. And you realize the more you keep doing that, it's getting more and more frustrating because this is no longer the place. That's what John of the Cross is. He's talking to the person for whom that's no longer where they are. And he talks about the risk of bad spiritual directors that don't understand this. And they keep telling you, try harder, try harder. And they don't realize that maybe the time has come. See, so you just quietly said empty-handed. And, and open and receptive. So that's how I would answer it. There. Yeah, that's helpful. So in the dark night of the spirit, it's you. You say this. You said this numerous times, but um, no thought of God is God. So you kind of come to that that realization, yeah. or the the yeah. the way you think about God doesn't fulfill you the way it used to, or give you certainty, yeah. or, or yeah. yeah. Saint John of the Cross is following Thomas Aquinas here. This classical sense that the powers of the spirit, the lower powers. Um, uh, the lower powers are through the senses, mm -hmm. through affect, through all this. Okay. The higher powers are the intellect, the memory, and the will. See? The intellect, the memory, and the will. And so the intellect is purified through faith, and the memory is purified through hope. Mm. And, uh, uh, and um, the memory uh, and um, uh, the, the will is satisfied through charity, which is being infinitely, uh, infinitely in love with the infinite love that's infinitely in love with you, mm. see, which is beyond effect, beyond. So the higher powers of the soul, the dark night of the spirit, are those higher, are those. But the, the, the ones of the senses and the appetites, because we're formed, they go together. They're not separate, but he makes distinctions to clarify each one so we can then see how they're always together mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really helpful. And uh, so you've said before as well that you end up asking more questions than having answers, and that that's kind of, that's a, right, yeah. one of the things you yeah. notice. Yeah, exactly. And then I think also what happens is um, we, we ask a question that isn't met with an answer. Mm. 
but it's a question that's a kind of an openness in which we're graced with a realization. See? Not a, but it's a, it's a realization. And, um, and then also, I think another way to look at it, it's Thomas Merton once says, he said, we go along asking God all these questions. And so we think the idea is to get answers to our questions. So we read the mystics. I'm trying to get all these. He said, then it starts dawning on you that here all along, God's the one asking the question. <laughs> And you don't know the answer to God's question. As a matter of fact, you don't even understand the question. He says, we don't like moments. <laughs> <laughs> but that humility is where it starts. You know what I mean? It's being disarmed unexplainably. And we're gently, that's what these teachings are about. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking some time to explain that. Jim, that was helpful. Um, another technical question along those lines from Lynn. Would you agree to the map? of Evelyn Underhill, that there is, has to be an awakening experience before the dark night arises. So she talks about Underhill's map having these five components, awakening of self, purgation of self, illumination, the dark night of the soul, and the unity of life. Yes, yeah, so well, by the way, Evelyn Hunter's her book, Mysticism, it's a real classic if you're so inclined if you, I would speak to you as Lexi or just quietly walk through that. It's, I think it's 500 pages or something. But she was a teaching mystic. You know, it's really quite a beautiful book. And it's, and it's hard to find books like that with an overview of, of mysticism. Yeah, 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 contemplative overview. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and certainly that's one of them. In a way, the mystics do that. Yes. Mystically. In a way, they're like the interior castle, the thing. But she's stepping back to the, give a contemplative overview of these contemplative Thing, but she's doing it contemplatively. And you know, across contemplative different mystics. Across different mystics. Isn't yeah, she? she's, she's trying to draw the threads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's a contemplative. So here's my sense of mm -hmm. it. Right. Let's, say, let's say, I would put it this way. Mm -hmm. I'd put it this way. I'd say yes with a caveat. I would say yes, and it begins with an awakening. Can you can you define what she means by awakening when she says awakening? Yes. You were going along living your mm -hmm. life, and you were quickened. Mm. See? You were quickened. It was a sense of being unexplainably, not just in the presence of God, in the midst of nature, the arms of the beloved, with the child alone at night, quickened. But I think also, in maybe an ever so subtle way, you are quickened in realizing that the infinite presence of God is infinitely present as itself as the intimate immediacy of your very presence. Mm. The presence of a, in other words, you're quickened with oneness. You got a taste of all encompassing oneness, maybe very subtle, like that. It comes in birth, comes in death, but there's a quickening like that. Then in that quickening, there's an aura of where it ling the quickening lingers. And in the quickening and the lingering aura is the desire to, to abide in the oneness glimpsed, which is the path. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think people have these awakenings, but a lot of people don't have the gift mm. of the desire to abide. Mm. And then you realize that in order to abide, you're going to have to give up a lot. <laughs> this is Teresa of Avila on, on the interior castle, yeah. on the second mansion, that you're not just... It isn't just when you entered the castle, you were careless when you got in there and reptiles got in with you, which are habits of the mind and heart that compromise what your heart's looking for. But you realize you're raising the reptiles as pets. <laughs> that, is, that is, you're carefully nursing the compromising of your heart yeah. because you're afraid mm -hmm. see, to let go. We're afraid to lose this control we think we have over the life we think that we're living and so on. So and then, we, then we go, gosh, it's like the question earlier about being a mystic. What if I don't want to... This I don't know. See, but then you say yes. There's no real choice for me. See, I just simply have to let go of what I know God's wanting me to let go of because it's holding me back. It's holding the people who love me back. It's in my way. So I have to, with God's grace, work through that and move on and become every more grounded psychological, spiritual maturity. Then, in that willingness, an illumination happens in which the original awakening starts to habitually showing up and infusing itself 
in the intimate patterns of your mind and your thought and your emotions and your life. There's an habituated underlying, like an act, like um, this, the gift that awakened you is transforming you into itself. Little by little, back and forth is the illumination of this. And the illumination then is a dark night, which is the final death to any everything less than an infinite union with the infinite love of God. See? It really is a mystical death. Mm. And it's a foreshadowing of what happens when we die. Really, and uh, a tremendous struggle ensues because of the survival strategy is so strong. So for for John of the Cross, this is the dark night of the spirit. For Teresa, this is the sixth mansion. Mm. You know, for, like, so there's that. You go through that great. The Buddhists call it the great death. You go through that, and then 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 out of that comes the um, uh, this. Uh, what's the word that she uses? The last one is uh, 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 unitive. The you yeah. the state. Yeah. See? And uh, it, it becomes it becomes an habitual underlying all encompass. It's the God given godly nature of each passing moment of our life. See? Unexplainably being pouring itself out. Mm -hmm. Including pouring itself out as the divinity of the moment you're not aware of it. Mm. That no one's aware of it. You're aware of the divinity of that. Is ultimately just one thing is happening. And it has taken you to itself. See? And then, then you realize you're called to live in the world that way, providentially, see? whether you're alone or you're home. I, I, so, uh, so I would say yes. Mm -hmm. The only caveat I would add, I think she says this too in other writings in the system, she says it, is that sometimes that original awakening isn't recognized as an awakening, mm. but as a deprivation. Oh. For example, notice for John of the Cross, see, for Teresa, it starts out as the fourth mansion. You're going along and you realize your heart's being enlarged to divine proportions. That's how it starts. See? And then the deprivation and loss and all that comes out of that. For John of the Cross, there's no initial awakening. Mm. It starts with a deprivation. See? Mm. And you can't figure out what's happened. But the deprivation is actually your awakening. Because if you don't panic and listen very, very closely, you can start to feel in the poverty of your awakened heart, the awakening you couldn't see coming because it was infinite. Oh, I see. Likewise, in the way of a pilgrim, we'll be doing the way of a pilgrim later yeah. in this series. If, if I live that long, we'll <laughs> save this soon. <laughs> what God has in mind here. See, for the way of a pilgrim, how he starts out in, in the Greek Orthodox Byzantine tradition, is that he's a church on Sunday in Pentecost. And he reads in Paul, he hears the reading from Paul, that we should pray always with uplifted hands. And he walks out, and he says, well, how do I do that? See, See because I, I have to make a living. I have to, how is that even possible? But the point is, he said, the question forced itself upon my mind. Mm. See? And he could have no rest. Until, and he set out on a pilgrimage for the resolution of the question. So it didn't come to him as a grace. Yeah. It came to him as a dilemma. But as he looked upon it, that was the grace. Mm. I think also some, in a lot of ways for people, they re, like an AA, for example, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of living these steps, here your grace came in um, realizing you were drunk. Yeah. That was the grace. Mm. <laughs> see, see, it, so that was your most terrible moment of your life because it's killing you and you can't stop. See? But here as you look back on it, when people share their story of recovery, strength, and hope, and a whole room full of people recovering alcoholic, they share how that terrible moment changed their whole yeah. life. See? And so it comes as a, a lot of trauma work is this way too. Sometimes the trauma deeply accepted and walked through. We serendipitously stumble into the grace of God sustaining us in the trauma. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, I agree with her. As long as we know the awakening isn't always experienced as an awakening, like the joyful yes. thing. But sometimes it's a paradoxical awakening. That's the initial deprivation. That as we follow the path, we can see that it actually was our awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, it's reminding me of the way Richard Raw talks about Great love and great suffering, suffering yeah, as the yeah. initiators of the path. Exactly. Yeah. Love, exactly love or suffering right. beyond 
what our normal day-to-day ego can comprehend or, exactly. or cope with. Yeah. yeah. And also to suffer, I mean, the etymology of the word suffer is to undergo. Mm. So you suffer it, like you yield to love's ways, like you yield to the depth of your situation. Yes. And it's like you suffer it. Yes. Because God suffers you, which is the cross. You know what I mean? It's, it's the reciprocity of the suffering. Yes. That's, that's love. That opens really. up on the love. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, that's probably enough for today. Thank you for answering yeah. so many questions in such a in-depth, beautiful way. And uh, thank you again to everyone who sent in a, a question. Also, um, Jim, we got some beautiful pe- uh, some people who shared uh, very profound and beautiful stories of their dark nights. And mm. uh, they, they were a gift to read as well. That is a guy. I read them and very much so. Mm-hmm. See, that's the spiritual direction part, like self-disclosure of how they experience it or they're presently experiencing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. Well, thanks for this season, Jim. Thanks for everything you're doing. Surely, yes. And thanks to all of them. I joined, thank you and Corey and the whole thing that makes this possible. And thanks to all of them too, without whom this wouldn't make any sense. You know, so... <laughs> Our gratitude goes back to them, and and so yeah, gratitude all the way around. And one last thank you to Saint John of the Cross for his beautiful exactly. work. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And by the way, I want to end on that for just a moment. Look how often these people, like John of the Cross, the world was changed by a person's willingness to surrender to a grace that, at the time, it broke loose in their life. They had no way of seeing the far-reaching implications of this. The centuries later, people would still be touched by the sharing of what was given to them. And in some way, that applies to us. You know what I mean? There's something very mysterious about that. Yeah. 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 Beautiful note to end on. Thank you. It is. It is. Peace. Bye. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Center for Action and Contemplation. We'll see you again soon.